for that before. Okay, welcome. Um, my pleasure to introduce Alan Douglas to you and John Young. Um, to my mind, they're going to talk about something completely different. Uh, it's interesting that, of course, what IT projects always take you by surprise. Ah, I can hear myself. Um, and do things you never thought they would do, and this is clearly one example of that, I think. But also, when something comes out of the public eye and is being done, it becomes history quite rapidly. Uh, to my mind, the test ban treaties and all that seems an awful long time ago. I, mean, I know it isn't, but I, I, I have heard um, uh, Alan's talk before. I did, indeed, I recommend it to you as being rather fascinating. So, Alan, over to you. Thank you. Are these working? Is, so you can hear me at the back. Oh, well, a little, little, just a little preamble. Um, once upon a time, I drove a car from Ceylon, as it then was, to England. And as I passed through Tehran, and this is a time when the world was young, and you could tour around by car, uh, I happened to buy a copy, an email copy of the Observer. And I saw an advert there which advertised posts for geophysicists at AWRA. And I'd been working in the the bush and I felt like getting back to some kind of civilization. So I thought, oh, this will be good if I can get a job there. So I wrote to them and said, don't give all the jobs away. And eventually I was called for an interview. And I don't think I did terribly well, actually. AWE seems when I went there was seemed such an intellectual powerhouse. You'd almost feel the brain waves coming out of the out of the wall. And uh, anyway afterwards I mean, it kind of done too bad because one of the people there, Hal Thurway, who was the head of the group at Black Nest, said, Oh well, come on, I'll show you show you around. And Black Nest's a big country house, um, about two miles from the main Holdermas site. And so we drove down and then we drove the drive and here we were surrounded by rhododendrons and azaleas and I said to him, this is, a, this is a fantastic place to work. And he said, yeah, he said, but unfortunately we've, we've been called back to the, to the main site. So we celebrated our last Christmas in Black Nest and um, We've been repeating that ever since, and after 47 years, we've managed to uh, fight off all the admin and, and remain there. So that's where we, I've spent really most of my, well, all of my life, really, at the end of the way. So eventually I, I got a job. It took a long while because we had to do a security clearance, and as I've been touring the world, that took the ages. And eventually, on the 40th of September, 1964, I went to work and I was interviewed by one of the senior people and he said you've joined a group of world beaters. I thought well um, they'll be suspicious of this. In fact I said to one of the fellows, how the Americans do all this? And he said well you'll be surprised really. We, we do make our contribution and I like to think I joined these world beaters and helped to keep the, the group at the uh, top of the tree. On well, my first day, I had a, a talk with um, my immediate superior, a chap called Eric Carpenter, and he said, oh, and he said, I'd like you to take over the digital program. Well, I said, I don't know what a, a digital program is. Oh, he said, you'll be all right. There's a chap here, John Young. He knows everything about it. He'll, he'll show you what to do. And when I spoke to the other people in the group, they, or they were of the opposite opinion. They said, goodness, they said, we've been, we've been on the training course. And they said, it's not, you don't think you're going to write programs because it's just unintelligible. Nevertheless, um, John, uh, I, I, I remember asking John, can you program this up? I just want to, and he got me with these, these functions and um, he wrote it, I looked at it, I thought, oh yeah, I can kind of see the bit in the middle there that actually does this. Then there's a lot of lines at the top about dimensions and then there's a lot at the end getting the stuff out. 
but basically I could see how it was done. And very quickly I managed to uh, master whatever it was in those days, I think it was nine statements you could write in, in Fortran and um, you had the uh, IBM book of the intrinsic functions and away we went. And John and I together we, we developed um, much software because we were fir one of the first in the field of seismology, applying computers to methods that had originally uh, been done actually by computers which were of a different sort. They were females who sat cranking uh, handles and um, uh, probably a, a more interesting computer than the ones we've got now. <laughs> so John was my trainer and he was good at this and we made all these what we consider advances and so today I'll tell you a little bit about the kind of things we did. One of the things that the AWE uh, in the UK were famous for was the use of arrays in, size, in seismology. Not only put one sensor down to sense the ground motion, but to put a pattern of them down and bring all those in and process them and, um, and you hope, <coughs> increase the signal and suppress the noise. So here's this rather cumbersome title. It should really say um, computers in forensic seismology because that is the uh, term that has come to be applied to seismology applied to the uh, verification of test plans. Um, the problem with that is at one meeting where I used that term, he, one of the audience thought it was something to do with finding bodies in the ground. So, mm -hmm. I uh, didn't want to put you off uh, on the wrong track. So here's a little bit about the test ban. So given the treaty banning all nuclear tests, that's the confidence that you the test ban treaty, will it be possible to acquit the state falsely accused of testing? And we've been um, very active in that area, even when there weren't test bans, because the US tended to shoot from the hip and um, accuse the USSR of dastardly deeds, and we as honest brokers had to step in and, and sort it out. To convict a state that carried out a clandestine test, well up to now, and remember there is no test ban uh, in operation. The test ban that's been negotiated has not yet entered into force. But the people who test now want to announce it, want to boast about it. So this part of it doesn't usually concern us too much because our dear leader in North Korea uh, wants it to be, to be known. And so there is the, the definition at the bottom there of forensic seismology, seismology applied to test plan verification. So this is the famous black nest, as you can see. I've got a better picture. Hmm? I've got a better picture. Uh, I thought this was your picture. <laughs> <laughs> as you can see, it's a bit of a sweatshop. However, <laughs> you can learn to live there, and uh, you can see the, the remnants of the, uh, the original house, and then going off to, the, uh, to your right, is uh, a wing that was a, a dormitory and the, there was um, apprentices. That's what it was originally before it was um, uh, the seismology group. And, um, and when they, they vacated that, it became vacant and we, we uh, the seismology group, moved in. And the principal reason was because they wanted to have international relations, wanted to invite people from abroad. It was an international science then it's so much easier to get people coming into Black Nest until it, um, compared to the very, very classified AWA site. So, seismology and the test ban. Well, in 1963, tests were prohibited everywhere except underground. And anybody who lived through that time will remember that the USSR, in particular, had tested very large yield tests in the atmosphere. And there was great worry about strontium 90 getting into people's bones. And uh, so it was 
This prohibition really was an environmental treaty to stop these, uh, particularly in the atmosphere. But underground tests were a difficulty because the only way they could be um, detected was from the seismic waves they generated. And the question for us at the UAE was, can we detect and identify low in the tests? The government never said what they, what we were aiming for, uh, but we would say, well, let's see about one kiloton, and um, and then they could all, because they never said it, if we got out to that, they might want to want to change the uh, goalposts. And so what we're looking for is a nanometer of ground displacement at one hertz. Uh, from a, a long range, from, from a kiloton. It always surprises me actually that a test in the middle of the Soviet Union, the ground here would move a nanometer, it wouldn't be able to detect it here because there's too much background noise, but it's an astonishing thing that it will propagate to that, uh, that distance. So let's look at some of the rounds. There's been much, much negotiation on this subject. Round one starts in 1958 with a thing called the Conference of Experts. Held in Geneva, July, August 1958, and the great and the good were there. Sir William Penny, Sir Edward Bullard from the UK, um, a lot of big names from the States, Hans Bethe, uh, and um, their conclusion was that you could detect identify uh, nuclear explosions anywhere except those by the underground. It was followed by this conference on the discontinuance of nuclear weapon tests and the aims at that time was MB, that MB there is magnitude four and three quarters which was thought then to be about 20 kT. So it was thought that the first test that a new country would make be something like if you rush on the type um, device and it would be about 20 kT. We now know that that's, that MB4 and 3 quarters is probably more like 5 kT. But they failed because there was no method of identifying explosions. The only way that the experts could suggest for identifying explosions was from the um, what was called first motion, the way the ground moved at the very beginning of the seismic signal from an underground test. Probably all can believe that an explosion goes bang and, and everything moves out, and that means that at long range, the ground initially moves away from the, from the source. For an earthquake, assume it's on a fault, pushes in one direction, pulls in the other. So if you can find at some station a, mo a, mo a movement towards the source, then that would identify it as an earthquake. Unfortunately, you can't always have a station in the, in the right place. And then I said earlier there was the partial test ban treaty ban tests everywhere except underground. And then in 1974 was the 150 kiloton threshold test ban, which was due to come into force in March. Uh, 1976, and that was a bilateral treaty, the U.S. and the U.S. USSR. Then there was round two, 1977 to 81, so it's a big gap here, and this was President Carter's at the time, and it was trilateral negotiations, the U.S., the U.K., and the USSR. And the idea of this, how this would be monitored, each station, each, each country of these three would have 10 stations on their territory and all the data from those 30 stations would be available to each of the participants. The aims in this case were very ambitious. MB 2 to 2.5, two that's 10 tons tightly coupled in the ground or one kiloton fired in a large, at the centre of a large, a large cavity. And it failed because of disagreements on this the number of internal stations and basically the disagreement was the UK because the UK said, well, we're not having any stations on 
overseas territories because we're getting rid of most of those. And one in the UK is fine. And it's the same that Mrs. Thatcher, one of the first decisions when she came to power, the civil servants said, uh, Prime Minister, do you want to have 10 stations or one? And she said, one. That's it. But I think with the, the uh, was a slight uh, softening of the position, I eventually we had, uh, said we would accept three, but the Russians said no. And um, uh, President Carter regarded this as a terrible obstacle to the successful negotiation. I just put a little bit of a footnote there to show you how fast move, things move in the uh, threshold test ban uh, in, in, in arms control. But the threshold test ban wasn't ratified by the USA until 1990, having been negotiated in 1974. So now over to President Clinton's time, and just before that, um, uh, we had a meeting with the Americans and they warned us, they said, if Clinton gets in, there will be a test ban. And he hadn't been in too long, and before the talks died out, they commenced in 1994. And the aim now was less ambitious, it was just a few kilotons decoupled but more realistically, one kiloton. And the responsibility was given to the nuclear test ban ad hoc committee, the UN, and working groups were established, there were technical sessions on the verification, and one man particularly from AWE, Peter Marshall, played an absolutely pivotal role in the UN. Anybody that knows Peter knows that he has tremendous personal skills. And the, the, the US the delegations could never agree with them among themselves, and they didn't know how to approach it, and they'd sometimes say to Peter, could you have a word with the Israelis and see if you can get them to accept this? And Peter would go and he would talk to them and eventually get them. And then when he came back, the Americans said, oh, we've changed our mind. Can you go back to Israelis and tell them, let's, let's be as you were? So he played a tremendous role here, and um, he was, um, he, he said, it, it is said that he was regarded as the father of the, of the treaty. You might think that this is a rather glamorous world to go to the, the negotiations in Geneva, to be riding in the ambassador's car, something like James Robinson Justice, where the ambassador sweeps in and all the acolytes uh, follow behind. Uh, but I tell you, it is excruciatingly boring. At least for me, I couldn't get interested in it at all. I, I couldn't get to the stage. Every time somebody said anything, I, did, I said, oh, well, I probably need to think about that. That is no good. You have to come back pretty quick with a response. So what has come out of all these negotiations is something called the International Monitoring System. And it has a series of different types of uh, detectors. Radionuclide for sniffing out radioactive isotopes in the, in the atmosphere. Hydrophones, the uh, explosions in the oceans. Uh, that's not an advisable place to do a test because the sound propagates so easily across the oceans. A hand grenade in off California and picked up in New Zealand. Well, it, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but that's the kind of thing. That the propagation is, is tremendous, and, and um, so it doesn't need too many hydrophone stations to monitor it up. Seismometers, that's for ground motion, and over the years, the, U, the uh, UK, or AWE on behalf of the UK, has established four arrays around the world. Well, one in Scotland, they're still near that TKA. One in Yellowknife in northern Canada, Got a bit north in southern India and Warramanga right in the centre uh, of Australia. And if you look at them on a map, you'd be surprised to see that they all surround uh, the Soviet Union. Um, he, all these four will be part of the monitoring system, uh, but at the moment the, the Indians uh, won't be involved. They, they haven't signed up to the 
to the treaty, and uh, but the other uh, stations contribute data to that um, to that uh, international monitoring system. <coughs> There's also microbarographs and microphones for listening for bangs in the atmosphere. And I assume, I haven't checked with the people at Blank Nest, but I assume that the seismometers, the microbarographs, and the radionuclide detectors in stations uh, of this IMS are picking up signals from the, from the recent Japanese disaster. All this data from the IMS comes pouring into the International Data Center in Vienna. And this has now got to be organized. This is a huge computing task. It is trying to collate the, the information. Then the idea is to produce bulletins, and there is the interpretation and identification of possible explosions is then a national activity. So the UK will take that data, the bulletin, and look at it and say, has anything of significance happened? If you think there is, then there is the opportunity of on-site inspection, where groups of inspectors, type we, we hear much about looking for um, uh, weapons of mass destruction, these inspectors will go into the area and try and get information about um, testing, get radioactive material really to show that the test really did take place. So this was the timetable that was originally, when it was, it was open for signature on the 24th of September 1996, and one of the first signatures was Clinton, and I think he got out of storage the pen that President Kennedy used to sign the partial test pen, and, um, and he signed up. And there was a preparatory commission to be um, uh, set up 60 days after the treaty had been signed by 50 states, and then that in the early days, of course, a lot of people were signing up pretty quickly. Then there was the setting up of the IMS by the Preparatory Commission, and then it would, the treaty would enter in force 180 days after ratification by 44 nuclear capable countries. And that hasn't happened. The, it's not in force because certain members of that uh, 44 have not signed up and the main culprit is the USA. And we were pretty optimistic when President Obama um, came to power. In fact, one of the Americans um, sent around an email saying, should we arrange a, to have a party when it's, when it's ratified? And ever since then, <laughs> the possibility of ratification has slid away. So we're waiting, and so there is no test ban actually in operation Although the IMS and the IDC are all are all fun. Well, we better get down to now to saying something about computers and uh, seismology. In 1958, the first discussions were held. So William Penny, uh, listening into the seismologist talking, as the have said, that this is a Stone Age science. And I could understand now that what he felt, because he was the head of RE, uh, money, I wouldn't say money was no object, but his job was to get nuclear weapons for the UK, and so he had access to money to buy the best equipment and the, the best people uh, to work on these problems. So re most recordings were on, on paper, and um, even though we say, well, you know, I think it's much better with computers, the basic structure of the Earth was worked out by these early seismologists using readings taken from paper records. Some of them pretty um, poor, not quite a thumbnail dipped in tar, but a pretty raggedy uh, line. But they, they could interpret these signals and, um, and get the basic structure. So the first use that these were put to, the, uh, certainly in the UK, was to take these point readings that had been made from paper records and process them. So instead of, um, in the past, people would do hand cranking to, uh, uh, to uh, work out an epicenter, this was this thing that could be very quickly um, programmed and software produced and um, speeded up enormously and the increase in accuracy and all those good things um, uh, took place. And then there was the move to magnetic tape, 
in the early 60s, that opened the way to an automation of the analysis of, of seismograms, but there was always a problem of storage. I had to keep signing for um, tapes to put all this data on, and um, The problem was then you had rooms and rooms full of tapes, thousands and thousands of tapes, and the search was on for the mass storm. And there is, uh, I've just mentioned a couple, every now and again a word would come, ah, oh, the mass storm, it's been solved. And the carousel was something like flying boats in the, in the, um, uh, in the fairground where the arms sticking out from this rotating uh, Machine, and hanging from it there were um, transparent uh, plastic uh, sheets which had indium salts in them and the lasers could hit this and put black dots in this and, and code the, the signals uh, into this, these transparent sheets. And then when you wanted a particular signal, the carousel span, they pulled out the right sheet, they wrapped it around the reader, and what did it read? It read the dust. So that was quickly abandoned. <laughs> then there was a tape recorder with a million bits per inch. And this was a very wide tape, but it was going really well. And they took it off, you know, filled one tape, took it off, put it on the arm, took it off. Somebody said, oh, I want an earlier tape, put it back on. Couldn't get it back in just the position to read the right million bits. So that was about them. And then, I don't know what happened. People who, who understand these things uh, about recording and tape recording, DAC tapes um, became available, exabyte tapes, and of course discs, and suddenly it was no problem. It was just, inf seemed infinite, infinite storage. So here is the, the AW, one of AWA's main contributions, is the work on seismometer arrays. As I said, the, the only method of identification was to see where the ground moved at the very beginning of the seismogram. But usually that was a very small dis, uh, oscillation, and it was often very weak, and it, it was almost hidden in the noise from these low yield shots. So you want to improve the signal-to-noise ratio. And so the obvious way from physics is to lay out many uh, sensors, and then you combine those in some way, you hope the signal adds up and the noise cancels out. And so AWE set off um, to uh, investigate these. A lot of people were there who had um, experience with aerials and so on, and so they all had theory they could bring to bear on this problem. And you will see there on the, um, the bottom left where it says WMSO California, that was an American array, a very small array. There's one kilometer between those, um, uh, those seismometers. So we're looking down, down here. And the UK said, uh, well, the reason they had that, because computing power wasn't very great, and there's a finite time of propagation across the array. And if you want to combine the signals, you've got to line them up and then add them up. Whereas if they were close together, then the time delay is very much, and so you can just sum them directly. The UK then said, oh, well, no, no, we've got to go for bigger arrays. And that's this first one here, Estelmuir in Scotland. And that, the length of those arms is a, it's about nine kilometers each of those arms. And the U.S. said, oh, uh, you're going down the wrong track because you can't process that. And, um, but then we said, no, no, we, we're going for these, what the company does, medium aperture arrays. And then we went for the yellow knife array. Which is this, here, yeah. this is five kilometers. And Eventually, the, the, the results from this were, were pretty good, but the problem was that it wasn't automated. It was done uh, basically hand-cranked. We heard that the Russians had tested, so we'd go and find that, go and find that signal. And I remember being in a meeting in 1966 in Cambridge, and then um, a chap called Ed Kelly, who came from uh, MIT, 
said, well, we've looked at what the, the UK is doing, and uh, we saw that it was doing pretty good, so we thought if a little bit of something does good, a lot of it will do even better. So they went to the large aperture side of the ray, which is over here. This is 50 kilometers now, and each of those black dots has a 25 seismometers like this, this here. So this is 525 seismometers, and I put on to there, in the, in the corner there, the yellow knife array to show you it on the scale. And they set this up, and they could handle it. They had two PDPs um, just to format the data, but they, they managed to handle it. The only trouble was it was a complete disaster because this, it was too large, and the signal changed its shape so much as it crossed the array that you couldn't add them up and get any signal So they they overstepped the mark there, they, they tried another one in Norway and they had the same kind of problems, probably actually even worse. So then they went back, the little arrays, and that one is, is multiplied by two, it's expanded by, by two, and, um, and we stuck uh, with the arrays. So array processing, what do we have to do? Well, if we know uh, when there was a test, we know the rough epicenter, we know the origin time, and we want to find the signal easily on the spool through the tip. You can predict the arrival times at each side monitor. You can line them up and, and so on. And, uh, but for automation, and this was the big problem, you have to search all points on the Earth, basically. Line up possible signal, some, see if anything appears. And it was that kind of problem, that's one of the big computing problems, is scanning the whole, uh, what turns out to be wave number space, to see if you can find find signal. The computers available in 1962 uh, were inadequate for this, this kind of processing. And the US claimed it would take two stretch computers to process the data from a UK type array. I just read a little bit uh, recently by an American that was involved in this, and actually behind the scenes they were doing something like this. Not quite as, um, uh, as detailed as you'd want, but they were making the stuff. Anyway, the UK took up the challenge. We, there was a famous meeting in, in March, I think, 62, and the UK were repulsed with the uh, um, came back with the tail between their legs, but they picked up this challenge and they started to build a special purpose hybrid processor in Saga. And really we should have taken gardening leave because by 1966 the Canadians had solved the problem with the PDP. And we very quickly got our own PDP and we um, had a man who had been an analog computer programmer and he just took to it like a duck to water and in no time we were um, setting up processes at our array stations. And as I said, the, U the USA had been processing an array of 525 elements compared to the uh -huh. 20 elements we were If you go to Bletchley, you will see the um, PDP, one of our PDPs. When we asked MOD, could we give the PDP to Bletchley, they said, oh yeah, fine, just just smash the hard disk and, and there's no problem. We said, well, hmm, that possibly defeated the purpose of giving it to, uh, uh, to Bletchley. Anyway, they, they relented and, and I think it's probably uh, in operation or, or can be run anyway with some test data. So the lack of computing power became less and less a problem, but in those early days with that large array, when they tried to process by the most advanced methods, because a lot of resistance among some people in, uh, in the US, some of the psychologists, they said it's a ludicrous waste of money, and 
they were all were sniping at the um, activities of the group that was running this, and they were overjoyed when the group took 24 hours of CPU time to process two signals and get one dB gain in signal to noise. Often the seismological data, because there's a lot of it, was used to test out systems. And I don't know whether anybody uh, remembers something called ILIAC, which was a, a 64 parallel processors, and some work was done uh, in the US to, uh, to see if they could speed up these processing methods. But computer technology was going so fast in those days that lack of computing power just, just fell by the way somewhere was overcome by, uh, by advances in, in technology. And, but for test band verification, automation is needed. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is seismological stations collecting digital data, sampling gets up to uh, 40 hertz, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, a lot of data. Number of stations are increasing rapidly. And the first step is to collect all the data into a data center. And seismologists were one of the first users outside the, the weapons labs in the, in the States to uh, use the archive. And John may say uh, a bit more about this, but um, I think Blackness was one of the first people to use the ARPANET in anger, because UCL had a, uh, a hub and we had a a spur and we would feed data through the system and uh, we put a bit of money in and, and kept it going and um, I was obviously not uh, an entrepreneurial mind because I used to find this a terrible irritation this this terminal because it seemed to occupy people's time and I should have been thinking I think I'll invent Amazon books and uh, but um, uh, I missed a few of these uh, these tricks. But anyway, we were some of the first users of this um, uh, of the ARPANET, and the data is brought together and to form a bulletin. And here, if anybody wants to uh, make their name, we can solve this problem of association. So the biggest problem uh, is association, and what that means is each station is producing, is detecting signals and producing a stream of sections. Sometimes it gives a bit more information, says roughly from this area, and um, um, it, just, it just went off on the screen here. Uh, and the idea is to change these lists by station into lists by seismic disturbance. And if there's only one earthquake a month, then that's pretty easy to do. But if it's one earthquake an hour, and uh, well, even more actually, more detections an hour, one significant earthquake an hour, but more detections an hour, deciding if this signal at this station is equivalent to that one at another station, slightly different times. And bringing all these down and producing a bulletin is a very computer intensive task. So here's the other, other problem with just an awful lot of earthquakes. Um, uh, at magnitude 4, which will, let's say that for round numbers is a, is a kiloton, as they say about one an hour. So if you're going to do a lot of um, analysis, you have to need a lot of people, or you need a lot of automation. And that's a map centered on somewhere in Africa, and it shows very clearly these um, clear boundaries that you hear so much, much about. So let's look a little bit at some data now at last. So the top of that, um, the top channel there, is the signal from a single uh, seismometer. And um, you can see there's noise, and that dashed line there is meant to say somewhere about where the signal starts. And then the second channel down there, the second uh, line down, is the sum of the 19 elements and you can see the noise is snuffed out and the noise and, and the signal is uh, is clearly shown and 
And this here would seem to say the ground initially moved down. Anybody that uses causal filters will know that you've got to watch it when you're filtering a signal and this, these top two are being filtered into a very narrow band and it works very well for signal to noise but it doesn't work very well for capturing the signal because the third line down is a wide band that's what we want, the wide band signal when we sum that, which is the next line down, four lines down we have um, a signal noise improvement and you can see that dashed line is marking something that goes positive. So if we took the top, the second line down, we would be saying it's negative. Definitely an earthquake. When we come down to this one, we say, well, it's positive, so it's ambiguous. We can't tell. And the bottom line is actually a, an attempt to filter, frequency filter, but we don't like using frequency filters because you're taking away information. And that's in the Marianas Island earthquake, which lies to the west of, um, of Yellowknife, which is where this was recorded. And um, let's look at the, uh, the thing in rather longer length. The top line there is the uh, single channel again. The next line down is the sum of 19 elements. And you look along that and you say, well, um, that just fades away steadily back down to the level of background noise. But being of a suspicious mind, we say, I wonder if there's anything happening at the Nevada test site, which lies to the, to the south. So you put in the time shifts to bring any signal that comes from the Nevada test site, and um, lo and behold, we see that second signal down there. This is from a, an underground test at the Nevada test site. It has the code name Ildrin, which I th used to think was the winner of the Kentucky Derby in 1900, but actually turns out the winner of the Belmont Stakes, <laughs> which uh, takes place in, uh, in New York, because uh, the Americans always have some kind of code name on their explosions. It's a very useful uh, way of, um, of remembering them, actually, better than trying to remember dates, and um, at this time they were always reducing the names of famous, famous race horses. So there's the property of the array that could separate out signals coming from, from different directions. Now let's look at some problems that we've had, and we've struggled with these for, the, for 40 years, basically. The US with emphasis was on signal to noise, and if you can prove it by frequency filtering, why go to more elaborate methods? Couldn't seem to get over to them that by filtering more and more tightly, you are removing information. And the two large arrays that they built, uh, the signals and the noise were so highly variable across the array that they didn't, didn't work. I don't know, I still don't know whether they were unlucky in their choice of sites or whether if we didn't try to build a, uh, large arrays like that, we would have had the same problems. And we've been asked many times, how did we pick the sites that we had, which turned out to be good sites? The problem, as you saw on the example I showed, the low frequency noise tended to get, uh, when you did it wideband, the low frequency noise was still there. And Instead of approaching this and saying, is this noise coming from a different place than the, the signal, everybody resorted to that classical. And there was also a confusion of purpose. Uh, what are we doing with the array? Are we going to a noisy site to improve it? Or are we trying to find a quiet site where the noise level is low and push that down even further? And in those early days, actually, the computing power still too slow for the, uh, the advanced methods of processing that uh, had become available. And the methods didn't seem to work anyway. So I hope there's some people here who are uh, <laughs> interested in uh, signal processing. Uh, I, I wanted to, uh, a, a 
pointed, really, but... Uh, Hmm? Yeah, but I want you to, I want you to be able to point the actual one. And where do I do? Press it. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, so this is, these are all synthetic. This is synthetic noise and synthetic signal. And this is me trying to clarify in my mind how array processing works. So we look at this top left, what is it, four channels. The top, it's a two, it's meant to be a two element array. The bottom one of that is the signal and to each of those channels I have added some white noise. And then I sum them on the third channel and the noise hardly goes down. So if the noise is like that, you need a lot of, uh, a lot of size of this one, much better. Here, this is idealized noise. The noise, the peaks and the troughs of the noise are um, opposite each other. So when you sum the two, they cancel out. And you get the signal perfect recovered. You say, well, that's, that's good. What other ways could the array suppress noise? Well, some array sites are like on, on here. The first channel, noisy. Another channel, no noise. If you add the two together and divide by two, you're left with a noisy channel. But if you say, well, oh my goodness, there's one channel here which the signal noise is excellent, then um, pick that. And the mathematics if you just processed it, would tell you that it's a take that channel two. Here is a type of noise that you would think you couldn't get rid of because peaks in the noise are the same position and on both channels. So when you sum it, nothing happens. You sum it divide by two, you're just left with the signal in noise as before. But in this example, I have made one of the channels 99% of the amplitude, the noise, 99% of the amplitude of the other channel. So I crank that up to make them two equal and I subtract one from the other. And the noise disappears. Unfortunately, if there is distortion of the signal, when you do this, you find that that distortion is amplified. And that's what this is meant to, to represent here. This spike comes from an error in the data, basically. And as we try to do this kind of processing, we were always stymied because the maths kept sliding away into these other methods of reducing the noise. And they produce signal distortion. And we were designing the filters on the noise ahead of the signal. And it works spectacularly well in the time bracket that um, the noise has been designed on. And then once it got out of that, it just went mad. And I read that the thing to do is to use a noise model, which I took ages to, present, to persuade myself that that must be the way to go. Because now when you're using a noise model, you're not designing it on the uh, noise that is present, the, the observed noise, and you, do, you can avoid these other ways of destroying the signal, destroying the noise. And here is an example that actually works. This is my typical example. See the top channel, you can see one, one size monitor, and it's noisy, low frequency noise, and then there's the signal. Some of them, well, the noise is reduced a little bit. Tell it the properties of the noise. Tell it comes from any direction and is traveling at this speed. And the noise disappears. Now, now I can widen the band a bit. Signal completely disappears. Some of the channels sort of starts to appear. Apply this noise model doesn't quite get rid of them, 
but the signals here and here is the uh, some extra arrivals which tells me that this is an earthquake at a certain depth. You could use noise models for frequency filtering. The top you can see a East Kazakh explosion riding on some sinusoidal noise. You can bandpass filter it and pull out the signal. But the signal is a distorted version of the little pimple that's riding on that noise. Tell it the properties of the noise from the noise model and subtract that noise model, no, model noise from the from the uh, recorded signal and you bring it out and it is roughly the shape um, of the signal that you can see at the top. So a little bit about the IMS now and the IDC activity. In September 2005, this gives you an idea of the kind of data flow, each month 70 gigabytes of IDC products and IMS data and data segments were distributed. Over 3 million bulletins and data segments distributed 88 different state signatures. 125,000 geophysical disturbances. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, mining blasts were detected and reported. And the astonishing thing is that 75% of the detections can't be associated with anything. They're just a detection. What is it? Only 25% of them. So there's a huge area for research here, what are these extra, extra arrivals? So where are we now? Well, computing power is probably more than adequate, certainly for, uh, we need just better algorithms. Signals detected, onsets are red, amplitudes are red automatically, but nevertheless, all this data is passed by an analyst the computer can still make mistakes, just glaring errors have to be corrected. Association remains a difficult task. The IDC, is, the, the International Data Center, is not making best use of the available methods. They call the F detector, which is a much more superior <coughs> detector than the ones that are used. Azimuth estimation uh, of surface waves, and this is an important thing. When, the, when these waves are coming in, um, you want to do this association probably but to say, well, it's coming from that direction, so it must be associated with an earthquake over there. You may remember the um, Indian tests when they, they claimed to find a hydrogen bomb, and everybody said, no, oh, the yield is at the most 20 kT, might even be just 5, and they were uh, looking around for any seismological data to support their view. And they found a large signal about the time expected the surface wave from their sort of so-called hydrogen bomb test. And they said, there you are, look at that. That's, that shows you it was a, a high-yield shot. Unfortunately, it didn't come from the Indian test site. It came from Spitsbergen. It was an earthquake in Spitsbergen. It just came at the wrong time. So I say that we're awaiting ratification by these 44 nuclear capable states. So even though there is a treaty, it is not currently entered into force. And the problem is that uh, I say the main culprit is the USA, who has not uh, ratified it and doesn't look as though it will be um, ratified in the near future. And there we are. So is John going to give his talk, or are you going to uh, we I'm take questions now? Questions now. I, do. I, I don't mind. I can. Yeah. I can. Yeah, I think I do. You take questions. Okay. Okay. And then okay. I come in, and then I take questions, and then we do a talk. Oh my goodness! This is uh, kind of tough. Right. Question twelve. Silence. Does that mean everybody's slept, or I mean it's so clear that uh, there's no 
just just an observation, really. It yeah. seems an awful lot of work, uh, a massive amount of work, to achieve not very much in terms of test plan. What do you mean? The fact that the test plan isn't in up here is yeah. not really well, I mean, oh. it's now as well. Oh, it is. It is. I mean, I, I for years I didn't think the test plan would ever come back because. Um, nobody's heart seemed to be really in it at uh, times. Especially this is that. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, well, particularly the US, there were a lot of people in the US who were very resistant to it. Very resistant. And you're right, and, and I find it difficult to imagine now that is, what is it, nearly 15 years since, is that right? 15 years since it was negotiated. Yeah. And, and where are we? Where are we? And they keep having meetings and uh, was it review conferences? And right, the fortunately the science was interesting. Yes. <laughs> so, so, um, and and I say I, I I couldn't take the international meetings. I just Peter was mm -hmm. so I was so lucky to have somebody on my staff who liked that, and he commuted to Geneva for. I think, years uh, and um, the thing that used to astonish me was we'd come in on a Saturday, we'd meet up on a Saturday and you'd say oh this happened and that happened and then there's this problem and we'd discuss it and about Thursday uh, of the week um, we, I'd get the newspaper cuttings and I'd say goodness it says here in Geneva they didn't agree with this. That's astonishing, that's just what Peter and I were talking about <laughs> but of course he'd gone back <laughs> and he was so good at, at um, uh, presenting the case. He's the, he's the only person who's ever had a round of applause in one of these meetings. <laughs> he, he was asked to give his personal views. He said, I'll give my personal views, but he said, I won't take questions. I'll just give this personal view, and that's it. So when he finished, the Japanese Ambassador stood up and he said, I'm not taking questions, I'm not taking questions. And he said, No, I'm not taking questions. And he said, No, I just wanted to say, could we have a round of applause for the speaker? Well, it was, it was terrific. And, um, uh, I got a different vision of what diplomats, the diplomats seem to want to. Um, well, they were, they were very proud of their position. They were like cocks strutting about on the uh, top of the donkey. And, um, uh, whereas Peter was just was so amenable and so easy to talk to, he, he just um, smoothed out many of the technical, technical problems. It's a little question. It's the only time I've ever asked. I think on the last slide, but one, we saw that what we need is better algorithms. Yes. So the innocent question is, what skills would you put in an advertisement for the better algorithm? Well, well, what you don't want is a computer person, because much of the software in the IEC, I think, it, it, it's. They say beware of Greeks bearing gifts, but beware of the US uh, bearing gifts because they donated this software and it's not the way I would have done it. And I think it was written under contract. People say, you know, you try to specify what you what you want and you, uh, you uh, send it off and some contractor says, yes, I'll do that. But to me, it has to be a learning process. You, you try it. And then you say, well, I've got to tweak it here because this is, I, I as a seismologist understand why this is failing at this particular time or why it's getting confused. And um, it is very difficult. You need um, twin so you need earth science, signal processing ideas, and then the skills of course to put them into the uh, machine. You maybe could have there's a kind of organizing overall software um, plan. And that seems to be very poorly done at the IDC. I haven't 
do it with the software and be with it. But it seemed to me you should be able to pull off a particular block, say for finding azimuth. Oh, I've got a better algorithm, clip it off. But the thing <laughs> seems to be written and you take one bit off and the whole thing collapses and then you have to, oh dear, why is that linked? You know, what, what, what is it? So there's a, there's a software planner overall to get this line uh, processing going. And then there's, and the way we're proceeding at the moment is that we have a, a young man at Blackness, Neil Selby, who is developing some of these methods, like the Azimuth model, like the architect. And then we try and persuade the IDC to put it in cooperation. But it can't be done just by somebody who's a software expert. There has to be some knowledge of seismic signals of their, and their properties. Probably not. Probably not. Well, it's probably not. Well, if you get into the IDC, if you get into the IMS, you, you can get I forget where it is. You can get a new car tax free every two years. <laughs> so, so that that's a, a uh, yeah. uh, the, the 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 money in the UN organisations. But there's another problem. You're probably the wrong nationality, you see, because <laughs> next year we have to have somebody from Ruritania to oh, keep a balance yes. between the uh, <laughs> different <laughs> sides. <laughs> Um, so that's one of the one of the uh, the problems. It's like the problem is a bit like a GPS receiver working backwards, where with no idea where an infinite number of satellites keep coming and going. It's a distance calculation. It, it it is. It's a it's a really difficult in that sense. They come in in, in because now the, I suspect the idea is saturated with Japanese yeah. earthquakes. Thousands and thousands and thousands of the coming in. And um, it's, you see, it's episodic, like this, there's, there's no structure to it, and, and it's a really difficult um, problem, this association. And uh, if I could think of an, an elegant way of doing it, you, know, you just want to be able to apply some transform and the thing all comes out. <laughs> but. I think that's um, that's wishful thinking. Last time, I was a big um, swarm. They actually gave up for three months. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, you can. Yeah. So, if you want to do a clandestine test, yeah, you have some time. Yeah, yeah. 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 You may, the, the problem is, you may have to wait now for 10 years or 20 years. This is the problem. With that kind of scenario, is you have to have your weapon down the hole. Computer waiting, it says goodness, magnitude nine in Japan. Uh, yeah, that'll swamp it. Go. Well, it's not going to be many governments that are going to allow that to happen. Come in one morning and say, Go, shot when? Oh, right, okay. <laughs> can, can I ask a sort of simplified question that maybe is too I assume the overall objective of this exercise is to protect. I can't hear you. It, the overall objective of this many years project is to detect underground nuclear tests. And a special task is to filter out the earthquakes. Exactly. To what extent do you know of this thing? You've been successful in detecting underground tests. Well, you see, if you have a nightmare, you might, well, the Russians might say one day, well, hell, you see, we tried one and we got away with it. You didn't pick it. No, no, but we, 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 we you know, have some intelligence which tells you something like your success rate. Sure well, success. well, you see, no, nobody was trying to hide them. Right. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> nobody, well, we assume, we assume nobody's trying to be nice because they wanted to show, yeah. oh, see? And um, the one that's the big mystery, it's not really a seismological problem, I think it was uh, something like the 22nd of September 79, the flash in the sky in the South Atlantic. And um, there was um, a scav well, everybody was scavenging for data, you know, or any data, radiometric data, um, <coughs> acoustic data, 
and it was one of those situations where some station had just been closed down a week before. Never close the station. It just you know, you had to guarantee to uh, mm -hmm. to trigger some event somewhere. And I still find it difficult to believe it's supposed to be a joint Israeli South African <coughs> test. I don't know. It was debated and there's books on it you can read uh, what is this the uh, the Samson option uh, and um, the, uh, the Israelis, you know, would pull the pull the temple down if, if they uh, by filing the nuclear weapon. They suppose they're one of the, everybody assumes the Israelis have nuclear weapons. I don't know what that's based on. But everybody assumes that, and they've never. If we they are tested, we didn't get it. give you this personal view of some of the workings of Black Nest over the past 50 years. Why Black Nest in the last 50 years, as Alan hinted, Black Nest had an interesting history even before the seismology group moved in on the 7th of March 1961. I know it was this day, I was there. Um, just before I carry on to the next slide, Alan mentioned about um, Black Nest and ARPANET and the connection there. We've actually done this talk with Professor Kerstein, so I'm going to It's actually not in my talk today. My jobs at Pat Ness were basically three. Of course, there was a lot of overlap over the years. I joined the group in September 1960 after leaving school. I did not realise at the time that the group had officially been formed only five months earlier. My first two years with the group was at what, what the lowest of the low called at the time an assistant scientific or ass sockies. I then requested a change of duties and became a full train programmer. In 1962, computer time was expensive, but programmers were cheap. And at one time, there were at least six of us working in Black Nest. By 1984, I was the last remaining full time programmer. And by 1999, there was no longer the need for me to be full time. However, I saw a niche for somebody to collect and review the seismic recordings made over the years of nuclear explosions and earthquakes. Nuclear, um, nuclear explosions had actually stopped in 1996, though there were the Indian and Pakistani explosions in 98. So it was all historical data, and that's why. I, called the Archive Data Specialist. This work kept me occupied until my retirement in 2006, and luckily it continued until today. And I learned last week, probably for another year, that's why it's got 2012. <laughs> uh, going on to computers, there's a new Fortran program in 1962. The first computer I used was the IBM 7030, which is also called Stretch, and Alan's mentioned Stretch already. Stretch was situated on the main site of Auckland Austin, so work was tra transported to and fro from, from Black Nest. This method of working continued for the next 33 years. Stretch was years ahead of its time. It had 64 bit words, 60 reused for numbers, leaving four bits which the programmer could use as flags. And we did some fancy work with those four flags at the end of the, in the words of the stretch. As an aside, 64-bit word computers did not arrive at Black Nest until 2007. Stretch could do multiple processing, and I don't think this facility was ever used. And we're discussing this earlier, and in fact, I'm almost certain that it wasn't used because the Atlas was supposed to be also multiple, multiple processing, but all the master decided that we would only do single processing at a time. Stretch was closed down at the end of the 1960s, and was eventually replaced after about a year with an IBM 360. The 360 was inferior to Stretch, particularly for scientific software, 
is it only had 32 bit words, which caused Mason, sorry, which had over 32 bit words, which caused major accuracy problems. I probably spent two years converting software to double precision. The 360 was also a good bit slower than Stretch. The 360 was situ still situated on the main site, so we were still using the courier service. The 360 was replaced by the 370, and then replaced by a series of IBM computers up to the IBM 3083J in 1995, being the end of the era Blacknest relied on main site computing. It must be said these IBM computers provided users with a very long period of stability for their software. While Blackness relied on main site computers for the majority of its computing needs, in-house computers were being used and developed. Alan's already mentioned some, which I'll come to in a minute. Initially, they were, these were special purpose, single task machines. It wasn't until the mid-1980s that there was computers for general use. By the mid-1990s, Blackness was able to become wholly independent for computing. So the first machine I can remember was a PACE and our computer, which was specifically built to process the data from Sardin and Rose. The next machine was called Sardin, which Alan has already mentioned. It was a hybrid computer using both analog and digital components, again specially built, and it was a way of its time. In 1970, there were two new machines for blackness for cycle processing. The first was a gift for the Americans, for blackness to evaluate, a mini computer called DC200, which from memory failed to work properly. The second, of course, was the P2P11, which when it was purchased was the first in the UK. The P2P11 superseded Sunder and was developed in house of blackness. This machine was upgraded and added to over the years and was still in use in the mid-1980s. This is the machine that is now in, in Fletcher Park. The Microvax replaced the PDP-11 and was the first general use computer of Black Nest. The Microvax was still in use until 1998 when the main disk failed. Fortunately, this machine is now also working in Fletcher Park. In 1984, Blackness received another gift from the Americans of Sun 2. This machine was the first commercial Sun 2 in the UK, and the service contract number was number one from Sun. Blackness had great assistance from the Americans in terms of impressive software from the time. The Sun 3 was replaced by the Sun 2, which Sun would not continue to support. And with a new operating system on the Sun 3, most of the software from the Sun 2 was lost and be used. The next computer acquired by Blackness was a DEC Ultrix, which was used to develop seismic processing and data transfer <coughs> software, which formed the basis of an embryonic data center. And Blackness was thinking about international data centers in the mid 1980s. With the purchase of DEC Alpha workstations, software from the main site computers was transferred, making Blackness computer, computing independent. The first Alpha called Blips which is now earmarked for transfer to Preston Park, so they're getting a third one eventually. Now all blackness computing is done on laptops. The some of the software originally from developed on Stretch still working this project. The ability to plot cytograms is fundamental to the work of blackness. Early plotters were based on cardiograms and drum recorders. For the output from programs, main site had a series of graphics devices available. The first significant plot for Blackness was the Strongo Carson SE4020. This plot was not only excellent for size bands, but also for maps. You see one of the maps um, shown. The SE4020 came with basic software from which plots and graphs could be developed, and also provided the basis of what are called the Blackness graphics emulators. So when graphics devices changed, we didn't have to change, change our um, software because we just wrote a new emulator for the graphics. The SE4020 was replaced by the SE4060, which was an even better plotter and also produced 35mm film. The basic software was maintained, but a high-level graphics package was also available from the main side. 
The SC4060 was replaced by a Versatec dot matrix printer with the emphasis on the printer. With a resolution of 100 dots to the inch, it was a plotting disaster. Particularly bad was the staircasing effect on sizograms. This inferior printer was eventually replaced by a Versatec with a resolution of 200 dots to the inch, giving sizograms of similar quality to the SC4020. To obtain to obtain publication, publication quality size grams, Blackness bought time on the triple-line FR80 plotter situated in the Rutherford laboratory. The FR80 was the Rolls-Royce of plotters and had high resolution. Unfortunately, it closed down at the end of 1984 due to high running costs. As an aside, there were two Calcom plotters available for use on, on the main site. Both were offline to the main site computer and used the output. The main advantage of Calcom plotters was the continuous paper output on the <coughs> size graphs. I can't recall whether the Penman plotter, which was purchased to fill the gap left by the FR80, ever produced a usable output. The only legacy I can find is the number. Over the years, the cost of the plotters has come down. Blackness purchased a series of plotters and now even color laser printers with higher resolution. It's still available pretty cheap. Alan talked about seismic arrays and so the shape, size, and location of the four UK type array stations. I was involved in the original simulation of the seismic array. I had a cut cable to specific lengths very accurately, which simulated the time delays of the seismic array recording. I remember the plot that was generated, and later this work was published as a Royal Society paper. The first seismic array was laid out across Salisbury Plain at Port and Dan, probably during the summer of 1961. The first working seismic array was installed in Wyoming at Pole Mountain and codenamed PMW during 1961 and was working by December of that year. Dates are rather hazy, but during 1962, the Pole Mountain array was dismantled and driven over land to Canada and set up as the Yellowknife array, the YKA array, certainly by December 1962. Meanwhile, the British seismic array of SWI, smaller than the yellow <coughs> one, had been set up and was working again by December 1962. <coughs> they followed the setting up of the Gary Bidden array, GBA, in India, and the Warramunga array, WRA, in Australia by the autumn of 1965. These arrays recorded their seismic data on analog tapes, which, being expensive, I think I mentioned having to sign them. <laughs> so the chips to buy them were recycled and reused. Back at Blacknest, when they arrived, copies were made of interesting and known events, usually five minutes, five to ten minutes duration. This recording started at GBA and WRA during the mid 1970s, and YKA and EKA followed in the early 1990s. In 1996, the Indian Array GBA uh, announced that the Indian government decided not to allow GBA data out of the country, and that's the situation still today. So at present, only EKA, YKA, and WRA are recording for the IMS, I think Alan had this figure as well, 24 hours a day, 20 channels each, and 40 cycles a second, however many gigabytes that is. I thought I'd change the tone now. Uh, this is a science about the, the timing is 40 seconds, from left to right. Um, the top line is what we call the beam, or the, sun, or the demand sound channel, and the, and the channel below is actually the, the single individual channel. Now this is what we've called an infinite beam. All we've done is just add all the sidebometers together without any delays. You put in a delay and you get that. And that is a third of a kiloton explosion from the French test site we called it at Yellowknife, distance of, of nearly 90 degrees. And it's a 1.6 nanometers, <coughs> a little signal there, uh, which is equivalent to about magnitude 4. Just to show you the power of the arrays. People can see that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. 
compared to these. It's my favourite. <laughs> This is a folder earthquake. This is a Tonga earthquake. It starts here, and there's the, and the, the, the other arrivals, uh, and it's been beamed um, for, for, to, 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 to so that the sun and there's noise reduction there as well. You change the direction of the, the beam and you then get another signal which is there. The Tonga uh, signal has disappeared almost completely and that is a, I remember rightly, that's a chemical explosion from Uzbekistan which is a different direction. So it shows you the power of the array in being forming in a different direction. seconds from one to the other. So, sorry. So this is the start here. Um, this is the start of the Tonga earthquake. So the Uzbekistan signal is, is probably that. But it looks like part of the Tonga signal. something new. Alan didn't talk about the so-called geo wars. He did sort of vaguely hint at it. It wasn't a real war, more a war of words between the Soviet bloc and the West. There was a disagreement over the yield of a nuclear explosion in its recorded magnitude. For example, in Estonia, in KRA, in Scotland, the magnitude of a Russian nuclear explosion is much larger than the magnitude of the American explosion of a similar size. There's a poster in Black Nest describing this difference with plots of the two size rounds. The plot of the American explosion is definitely much smaller than the Russian one. How much smaller I found out when I checked the processing during my time as, as the archive data specialist to discover that the recording had been beamed in the sun set for 116 degrees east instead of 116 degrees west, which is the, the uh, western, western um, value for, for the Nevada test site. The poster plot has been corrected, but no one can tell the difference. <laughs> the discrepancy in the magnitudes of recording between the Russian and American explosions was confirmed in 1989 by what is called the Joint Verification Experiment, for which the Russians and the Americans fired similar sized nuclear explosions at their test sites. So this is, this is the Russian explosion. Um, the top trace is the, is the beam, and that's a um, single channel. So, uh, because it's so big, it, it really the uh, the array is not doing much work on the noise. However, when we go to, when we go to the uh, American explosion, which is called Kesage, and says they all have uh, different names, which is very useful. You can see it's very noisy. There's the, uh, the signal there, so you get good good improvement there. Um, uh, Shigan was 350 nanometers, which gave a magnitude of about 6.6. Kesage was 33 nanometers, giving an MV of about 5.5. So there's um, a whole magnitude difference for this recorded at uh, I think Zestel Muir. Modesto, you're in Scotland. Um, I've just sort of put this in. Um, Black Nest had to do this Y2K exercise twice. Uh, Y2K, for, for those who don't get much older than ourselves, that was the exercise of checking computers and software for possible date failures of the millennium. Thanks to the BCS, 
Um, in, I thought that early morning of the Millennium Bug, Blackness Colours was checked in 1997. Due to a lack of foresight by main site, Blackness had to repeat the whole exercise in 1999. As an aside, Blackness has long experience with data problems. On the early recordings, the year could only be stored as four bits, meaning that it was a single integer, so the year was just one integer. For example, working out whether the tape was from, say, 1974 or from 1984 could be a problem. So in conclusion, I was fortunate to have been sent to the seismology group when I joined AWRE and being in the group near the beginning. The move by the group from the main site to Blacknest in March 1969 is what we're celebrating today. It was a long time after joining the group that I realised the significance of the work being done at Black Nest. I have been lucky to have worked for and with some exceptional scientists during my time at Black Nest, and I'm grateful this still continues. Despite the many ups and downs, Black Nest remains open and continues to thrive. And like other Golden Jubilees, Black Nest has been very low key, perhaps because it has remained open. Let's hope for many more years. Thank you for letting me to contribute to this meeting. Hold on, I've got more to come. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, very kindly sent to me by people of Blackness. This is the Japanese earthquake. The start is here at 0559. Um, these are all the, the uh, seismometers over the uh, over the UK. It's what is called UK Net, um, and they're all broadband. And you can see that there is some sort of move out as 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 the wave travels across the country. It's recorded at different times at different in, in different um, different seismometers. So that's that's what they call the onset. Um, this is the main body of the seismogram. It's there's the six o'clock. So that little pebbles there are actually the onsets that we saw at the pre on the previous slide, and it goes on to for two hours. Um, unfortunately, they, um, there's no uh, um, no right, no um, amplitudes given on that, but it's huge. And it, assuming that it was actually magnitude 9, and looking at um, uh, the Murara one, which was magnitude 4, which was a third of a kiloton, that's 10 to the 5 bigger. So the, with a bit of luck, we could say that the Japanese earthquake was equivalent to 35 megatons. But it wasn't the earthquake, of course, that did the damage. It was the tsunami. And just as a comparison, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Hiroshima was 13 kilotons and Nagasaki was 21 kilotons. So I'm finally back this now, one month ago on Valentine's Day. And I've got a little story here. As you see, one of my tasks was general duties. One of my general duties was um, the security liaison officer, which sounds a very grand title, but basically I was a locker-upper. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one, one lunchtime, there was a knock at the door, and uh, there was a lady there, and I said, it's going to help. She said, is this where the Alzheimer's Society is meeting? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> seismic array like physically? I mean, is, is it a sort of um, suitcase sized thing or a house sized thing? And, and has that technology uh, changed? Yes, like very much so. Perhaps um, Alan could ask that one because he's probably got more knowledge of seismometers than I have. So. Well, one of the great advances that has been made, which I didn't touch on, is in, uh, is in seismometer design. 
Um, oh, okay, thanks. Uh, when the project first started, um, a lot of seismometers or seismographs were weight tons. And um, then um, in the early 60s, they shrank down to things that weighed 50 kilograms. Uh, but they were high pass filters, so they were, um, uh, didn't uh, command very wide bandwidth. And then uh, there was an interest in um, reducing noise by going down boreholes. But uh, if you go down, uh, if you want a, a small size moment to go down a borehole, because it's pretty expensive to um, drill the hole, uh, you have a problem that um, the physical size goes down, the natural frequency goes up, and for conventional seismometers, the system noise goes up. So he was a sort of conundrum which they were trying to solve. And then, um, uh, I don't know whether anybody knows Professor Felgate, but um, uh, he was a, uh, an instrument designer and um, he was professor of cybernetics at, at Reading. And around about 1970, there was a realization that, um, first of all, um, displacement detectors apparently improved. So if you wanted to measure small displacements, uh, there was these improved detectors. And there was also the idea of using feedback and um, these ideas all came together in the design of small seismometers of low system noise. Anybody that's particularly interested, I'll try and bridge the memory and explain the sequence of events there. But nevertheless, we gave to uh, Reading University a contract to build some seismometers. And they had a young man called Ian Buckner, and he came and he built, I'm talking about now seismometers, so, three or four inches in diameter, uh, with masses of mm, 100 grams or something, I think it's 100 grams. And he built two horizontal components. And we said, that's wonderful, well, we need a vertical component. They said, well, that's, that's pretty difficult, actually, to <coughs> get a good suspension, because you've got to, they're all masses on springs, basically. So he went off, he got his PhD, he went off, and a young man called Jansen Gurup came as the um, as a follow-on PhD student, and the supervisor said, "Now we've had a go at getting a vertical component, but it's not possible. So we want you to take a standard seismograph, standard seismometer, which now would be a diameter of what, maybe ten inches or something." And I want you to put feedback onto this and try and make a wideband seismometer. And he said, oh, well, I can build a vertical component, a small vertical Oh, oh no. We're wise and old and we understand this. And you're just young and enthusiastic and you really don't understand the problem. No, he said, I can, I can, I can build one. Well, he said, do that in your own time. This is what we want you to, to concentrate on here. So the next day, he appeared with one made out of Meccano. Well, I don't think it was exactly the next day, but it, it, very soon he appeared with it. And they said, hmm, oh, well, all right, you can go in the workshop and you can play around in there. And very soon, he developed a vertical component size monitor. And he built us a three component set. And the amazing thing from this tiny machine you can get the tidal uh, uh, earth tides, the 12-hour the earth tides can be picked up on a thing with its natural frequency around a few, um, well, around one hertz, actually, or, or maybe a bit, a bit higher. And you can pick it up without any, any system noise. And um, for a while we held the patent on this, but then he went on to bigger and better things. And now, just outside AWE, between AWE and Blackness, there's a little factory called Gurhelp Systems Limited, and it builds seismometers for the world. And it's done fantastically. Well, very clever 
fat, very clever man. He's now multi-millionaire. <laughs> My goodness, he, he's and, and if you've got a, you know, want an instrument designed and built or something to set some something environmental effects, then here's your man. Don't All these uh, recordings were made by Garps. Oh, they, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's UK net. Yeah. yeah. So now we are to seismometers which are, well, I should probably give it in uh, metric, um, let's say, well, it's only 10, 10 centimeters uh, diameter or maybe even small. I think it's a huge variety of different, for different applications. But for me, the astonishing thing is that you can cover the whole seismic bank with one instrument running out, so I say, uh, periods of days. And get it all recovered from this, from this, um, these instruments. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting in the the choice of sites. Is there any significance in what the underlying geology is in well, Estelmio, Yellowknife, and? Well, I, I fear that seismologists are engaged in incredibly biased experiments. Because if you were to plot all the seismic stations on a map, you would discover they're all in seismic zones. Well, not quite, but there's a tremendous concentration. So what you're learning about is seismic zones. Very few distributed, well, more and more now they are, but, but uh, years ago they were always established because people were interested in the all over the earthquake, so they, they put out the, the stations. Um, now then, when you're going to put out a station, what do you do? You think, well, obviously, sometimes it's just chosen because your university is here and you want a seismic station nearby, so you choose somewhere that's convenient or where the, um, you have access to. You know, it's all those kind of housekeeping things that, that you have to think about. But the UK, uh, oh, and then there's another thing, people go around looking for low noise sites. Now this could be a biased sample, because you go to low noise sites, and you have to ask yourself, why is it a low noise site? Now that may be just random, so it doesn't bias the sample. But more and more, and the US are very, were very keen on finding low noise sites. In the UK, we, um, took a, 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 I think, a more methodical view. We, obviously, in the UK itself, you can't get too far from what's called cultural noise, um, which is the effect of, of human beings, trains, planes, uh, people moving about, and so on. And the noise here would be, level here would be enormous with all the traffic and so on. So the, the idea was to get away from uh, uh, human settlement and to go to remote places. So we went to Northern Canada, we went to um, Wyoming. Uh, well, Wyoming, yeah, well, that's pretty, that's, uh, you, know, you know, you come across villages, it says population five or something. Uh, so it's really sparsely populated. We're in the middle of Australia, southern India, well, a lot of Indians, so it's very difficult to get away from the people there. <laughs> um, but we try to choose sites on. Um, ancient rocks, Precambrian rocks, uh, and that turned out to be a good thing because the transmission through these rocks was very good. And so we, we I, don't, I still don't know why it's by chance that we got good sites. And this is the uh, experiment we've never done, but um, that's how we chose them. We, far from human activity, ancient shield areas, middle of continents if we could, and um, uh, some places you can't, of course, in the UK, you can't get uh, all that far, but, but not too bad. The one in southern Scotland, in the southern Uplands, uh, it's near Lockerbie, and uh, uh, tragically, we got a very good signal from that, uh, that particular area of white. So, um, so that's how they were chosen, and it seemed to be a good thing. But we didn't do the, we didn't say let's find a bad site now, and, uh, you know, compare the two. It's, so it's a biased experiment. I must admit, I remember Estelle Muir as being a pretty bleak place. Oh yeah. Fairly oh, wet. Oh, oh, fairly horrible. Oh, 
and oh very my goodness, <laughs> we, we, you're going to be a weird fellow to go and work in some of these places, I tell you. Well, I only walked over it a couple of times. So I didn't <laughs> and uh, at Yellowknife, um, there was one fellow, I think he was from Poland, I can't remember his name now. He went to the cinema every night, and it was the same film. For a week. <laughs> <laughs> it just because just there was nothing to do. And working at uh, remote sites, was, it's very difficult to get somebody to, to stay there and, uh, and be enthusiastic. That's the thing. You, you, you want them to make sure that that system is working. So it has to be somebody who's got an interest in the, uh, in the work. Otherwise, it just we tried to set one up near Brasilia. And, um, well, it was actually the British Geological Survey that tried to set it up, but we tried to support it. And we would send somebody out to try and, you know, get it up to scratch. And I think by the time they landed at Heathrow on the way back, it had failed. And nobody went to see what was happening. It's probably the snakes in the pit, actually. Because mm -hmm. I think when you took the lid off, <laughs> a nice collection of snakes in the bottom. <laughs>